There's a very famous story in the Bible about a prophet named Jonah. And God gives to Jonah the assignment to go to Nineveh and preach to them about repentance. Jonah doesn't want anything to do with this assignment. That's because he hates the Ninevites. The Ninevites have been cruel and have been oppressing uh, the people of Israel, his people. And so he does everything in his power to get out of this assignment, literally going the opposite direction from the city of Nineveh, trying to escape this assignment that God has given to him. Well, God won't let him escape. He causes him to be swallowed by a giant fish as Jonah is fleeing on a boat in the opposite direction. Jonah finally gets the point that there's no way he's going to get out of this assignment. He goes to Nineveh, this great city, and preaches uh, the gospel, preaches the good news that with God there is always uh, opportunity for forgiveness. That it doesn't matter what you've done, it doesn't matter how far you've strayed, that with God there is always, always the chance for forgiveness and reconciliation. The people of Nineveh hear this message. They're convicted to the heart, and they repent. But shockingly, Jonah's angry about this. And Jonah says to God, I knew it. I knew it. That's why I didn't want to come. That's why I wanted nothing to do. I knew you were going to forgive them. Now, the interesting thing about that to me is that Jonah is a prophet, and as a prophet, he's supposed to know God well. He's supposed to understand what God is up to. And here's this very interesting picture that struck me this week as I thought about it. The people who know God the best, the people who watch God at work the most, know that at his heart, at the core of who he is, God is loving. And even though Jonah doesn't like it, even though Jonah thinks this is working against him, he knows deep in his heart, God is always gracious and compassionate. God is always loving and kind. And he says back to God, that's why I didn't want to come. You're so kind-hearted and you're so loving. I knew you were going to forgive these people. Now that's interesting to me. That at the essence of of who God is, at the very core of his being, those who know him best know he is love. This morning, we want to remind ourselves and be reminded how much God loves each and every one of us. So please take a Bible and turn to the book of Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, page 917, if you picked up a Bible from the rack on the way in. This is the passage that Joe led us through this morning. He took us through the entire chapter of Romans 8. We're going to focus on the last uh, set of verses in Romans 8. For the past couple of weeks, Pastor Tom has been taking us through uh, Romans 8 talking to us about being led by the Spirit, talking to us about how our suffering is actually an opportunity for us to achieve glory that will far outweigh it. This morning we reached the last section of Romans 8, and really it's the halfway point in the book of Romans. There are 16 chapters in the book of Romans. And Romans 8 in many ways is sort of the halfway point. Paul has been presenting Uh, uh, opportunity for us to be able to know who God is and what God thinks about us. And here at the end of Romans 8, Paul has a chance to kind of look back over all that he's written so far, to take us back through all the things that we've studied so far this year, and to draw conclusions. What can we conclude from all that has been said so far? So we begin in Romans 8, verse 31, with the phrase, what then shall we say in response to these things? By these things, Paul means everything that he's told us so far in the book of Romans. We began this series on Easter Sunday, 
<clears throat> with the good news that because Jesus is risen from the dead, God has blessed those who are believers in Jesus with every kind of blessing, the greatest of which is our salvation. We went on to see that how even though every single one of us, every single one of us is a sinner, every single one of us has done many, many things to disappoint God, that God has chosen to use his kindness to lead us to repentance, that more than that, God offered Jesus his son as an atoning sacrifice to make amends for our sins, <clears throat> that through Jesus we have been redeemed, rescued from Satan, sin, and death, that we have been justified, declared to be innocent, that God has objectively demonstrated his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That now because of Jesus, we have peace with God, which means not that God is sort of neutral towards us, but that God is for us. That God is positively predisposed towards us. That we enjoy most favored child status in God's eyes. That God has set us free from the power of sin, both as a lifestyle and in individual choices. That God has set us free from the power of the law. That God has given us his spirit. That God calls us his children, that we have been adopted into his family. That God promises us eternal glory. Paul says, what can we now conclude from all of these things? From all that God has done for us, what can we conclude must be true? Five things. And they come in the form of five rhetorical questions that Paul asks in our passage. The first is in the second half of verse 31. If God is for us, who can be against us? From all the things that we have heard about God in the first eight chapters of the book of Romans, what can we conclude? The first is, if God is for us, who can be against us? Now when Paul says, if God is for us, he's not wondering if God is for us. He's already told us over eight chapters, Clearly God is for us. If he did not treat us the way our sins deserve, if he chose to give his son as a sacrifice for us, if we now have peace with God, God is not neutral towards us, God is for us. And the question is, if God is for us, who could possibly be against us? Now at first glance, we look around in our lives and say, there are lots of things that are against us. Satan seems to be against us. I had a pretty tough week this week getting ready for this sermon. Having our power go out and still be out was just simply part of that. We might have family members who seem to be against us. There may be people in the workplace who are against us. You may look around in society today and think there are lots of people against Christianity, against Christians, and even against me in particular. But the point is, if God is for us, since God is for us, none of that really matters. None of that really matters. Isaiah 54 says it this way. No weapon forged against you will prevail, and you will refute every tongue that accuses you. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. Psalm 21 says it this way. Though they plot evil against you and devise wicked schemes, they cannot succeed. Proverbs 21 says it this way, there is no wisdom, no insight, 
No plan that can succeed against the Lord. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Isaiah says, when you pass through the waters, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. Yes, there are people in this world. Yes, there are forces of darkness that would love to see us be destroyed. But God is for us and there is no plan. There is no plot. There is no scheme. There is no weapon. There is nothing that can prevail against you or I because God is for us. Do not be afraid. There are many in this world. Forces of darkness, powerful beyond our imagination that want nothing more than to destroy everything good about us. But do not be afraid. God is for you. There is nothing, no plot, no plan, no scheme that will ever prevail against you. Second rhetorical question, verse 32. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Now follow Paul's logic here. Imagine a mother and a father who decide they want to build a home for their daughter and new son-in-law to give them as a wedding present, that home is going to be nearby to them. They want to bless them. They want to show them how much they love them. They want to help them get started on their new life. They want the daughter and son-in-law to be near them so they can participate with them, so that they can show their love to them, so they can watch their family grow and be part of that. Now imagine that that's the case and at great time and energy and effort and money. This mother and this father help create and build this house for the daughter and the son-in-law. Now imagine that the daughter and son-in-law have moved into the house and the daughter comes over to her parents who are her neighbors and walks in and says, Mom, I'm baking some cookies and I don't have any butter. Can I borrow some butter? Could you imagine those parents saying, no, we built you a house. Get out of here. Get your own butter. This is our butter. Could you ever imagine that? If you're going to go to all of the trouble to build a house, if you're going to go to all of the trouble to express love to this child, of course you're going to give them a stick of butter. If God was willing to send his son, listen, for all of eternity past, the relationship most precious to God, the Father, is his relationship with God the Spirit and with God the Son, Jesus. If God was willing to give up this most precious thing, if God was willing to give this enormous, infinitely big gift to you and I, How could we possibly think that there would be anything that he would want to withhold from us? How could we possibly think there would be anything that when we went to God and said, God, I need this, he would say, I already gave you my son. What else do you want? Get out of here. Psalm 84, 11 says it this way. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does the Lord withhold from those whose walk is blameless. Ephesians 1.3 says it this way. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Every spiritual blessing in Christ. What can we conclude from the first eight chapters of Romans? If God was willing to give his son, 
how will he not, along with Jesus, freely give us all things? Do you see that? Graciously give us all things. When we were in Guyana, the missionary who was preaching at the church reminded us, all means all. Every means every. No good thing means no good thing. It's pretty clear. Why would we think that if God has already given his most precious thing, his son, for us, why would we think he would do anything less than give us graciously all things, everything that's good for us? You say, but I don't have everything I want. The promise of God is, is that if it's good for you, he would not withhold it. Everything. Notice it says, graciously give us all things. Not because we earned them. Graciously give us all things. We didn't earn the gift of Jesus. Why wouldn't God continue to give us all things? Listen, God didn't send his son so that he could be done doing good things for us. God sent his son so that we might become blameless in him, so that he would be free to open up the floodgates of heaven and pour out every spiritual blessing. The point of the first eight chapters of Romans is, is God loves you and wants to bless your socks off. He wants to give you every spiritual blessing. There is no good thing he wants to withhold from you, and there is no good thing he will withhold from you. Third conclusion that we can draw from all that we've learned about God so far in the book of Romans, verse 33, who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Now you might remember that we said the word justify is a legal term, and the idea here is in the courtroom of heaven, with God seated as judge, Paul is saying, how could anyone ever bring a charge against you or I? How could everyone, yourself, someone you know, even Satan himself, how could they ever bring a charge that could ever stand against you or I? Listen, we sang it this morning. The Lord knows the depths of my heart, and he loves me the same. Who could we possibly have sinned against more than we've sinned against God? If God has chosen to forgive us, if God has chosen to declare us righteous, could you imagine God as a righteous judge allowing any charge against us to stand? He's already declared us to be righteous. He's already declared us to be innocent. Listen. God didn't justify us and then sit back and say, I hope this works out. God knows everything that we have done in the past, everything that we are doing, and everything that we will do in the future. And on the basis of what Jesus has done for us, God has declared us not guilty. No one else knows the depth of wickedness that is on our hearts. No one else knows the things that we've done in the past like God does. No one else has been as hurt or offended by our choices than God, and God has chosen to declare us innocent. Amen. How can anybody, a spouse, a child, a grandchild, a parent, a coworker, a neighbor, how could anyone bring a charge against you or I that could possibly stand in God's courtroom? God's response to them is, you don't even know the half of it. I've declared him innocent. I've declared her innocent. And Paul says, no charge, no accusation in the past, in the present or in the future will ever stand against you or I? That leads us to the fourth rhetorical question. Verse 34, who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died more than that who was raised to life is at the right hand of God 
and is also interceding for us. Not only can no one in all of existence lay a charge at the feet of someone who believes in Jesus, there is no one who has the power to execute judgment against us. No one is allowed to condemn us. Not even ourselves. I love the way 1 John 3 says this. This is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence. If our hearts condemn us, we know that God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. Do you hear what this is saying? That even if your own heart which knows things about you that no one else knows, even if your own heart is convinced that you're unworthy, God is greater than your heart, and even your own heart's charge will not stand against you. In God's presence, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, not even self-condemnation. And if you're here this morning and you feel, but you don't understand what I've done, I'm not worthy to hang out with good Christian people. I'm not worthy to feel joy in life. I'm not worthy to serve God. Listen, I understand that is exactly how your heart feels. I understand that that is exactly how your heart believes. But I'm here to tell you that God is greater than your heart. And he has declared, there is no condemnation. God has chosen to forgive you. God has chosen to wipe away those sins. God has chosen to forget those sins and remember them no more. And no matter what your heart says, God says you are innocent. Amen. There is no condemnation. You can't even condemn yourself. When our hearts condemn us, God says I'm greater than your heart. There is no one, listen to me, there is no one who is worthy to decide your fate except God himself. Even you and I ourselves are not qualified to determine what our lives should look like. We want to beat ourselves up. We want to refuse to experience joy. We insist on not forgetting for the sins we've done in the past. That's our heart condemning us. But God is greater than our hearts, and he says, you are not condemned. I don't care what your heart says, you are not condemned. I don't care what you feel, you are not condemned. There is no condemnation, not for anything past, not for anything present, not for anything future. There is no condemnation. No one in all of existence, even yourself, can condemn you before God. All of which leads us to the fifth rhetorical question, which is where all of this has been heading. It's the biggest, it's the longest, it's the most important. And it says, verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword as it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. If there is no one that can be against us because God is for us, if God is going to graciously and is giving us all things, if there is no charge that can stand against us, if there is no condemnation, then the question is, what could possibly separate us from the love that God has for us? What could possibly come between the love that God has for us? No power, 
no charge, no difficulty, no condemnation. What could possibly come between God and his love for you or his love for me? Now we say, well, what about suffering? Doesn't suffering show that God doesn't really love us? Doesn't suffering, isn't that an opportunity? Maybe God will abandon us in the midst of suffering. That's what verses 35 to 37 are about. And the answer is, don't be deceived. Suffering is simply an opportunity for God to draw closer to us. Suffering is an opportunity for God to demonstrate his love for us. Suffering is an opportunity for us to experience the depth of how much God loves us. Listen, there is nothing in all of creation, nothing in all of creation, not yourself, not your sins, not your past sins, not other sins that others have done to you, not the wounds that you're carrying around, not your parents, not your spouse, not your children, not your grandchildren, not your grandparents, not your friends, not your enemies, not your co-workers, not the people in this city, not the people in this country, not the people in this world. There is no satanic power. There is no demonic power. There is nothing in all of creation, nothing, nothing, nothing in all of creation that will ever be able to separate you from the fact that God loves you. Listen, there is nothing that can stop God from loving you. Nothing. He is love. This is why the Bible says, trust in his unfailing love. There is nothing in all of existence, not you, not me, not anything that can stop him from loving us. He is love. That's who he is. There's only three times in the Bible God has ever said to be something where a noun is on the other side of the word verb is. God is spirit. God is light. God is love. This is the core of who he is. And there is nothing in all creation that can stop him from loving you. He loves you every moment of every day, every minute of every hour. He loves you constantly, totally, infinitely, completely. There is nothing that can stop him from loving you. Nothing. No charge, no condemnation, no suffering, no difficulty. Nothing, nothing, nothing will ever stop him from loving you. However, you weren't expecting a however, were you? (laughs) There is something that can hinder the effectiveness of his love. And that is Satan's deception. There's nothing that Satan can do about the fact that God loves you. You've heard that right here. He has no power over that. But he has one trick left. And it's the oldest trick in the book. He's been using it from the beginning of time. It's his one trick, his one lie. And his one lie is that somehow God doesn't love us. Now listen, that can't stop God from loving us. Nothing can stop God from loving us. But it can hinder the effectiveness of our experience of that love. And Satan uses that lie over and over and over again. And listen, whatever difficulty you're going through right now, that lie that somehow God doesn't love you is at the root of it. Whatever struggles you're experiencing, whatever darkness you're facing, whatever sin you're choosing, whatever thing you're doing at the root of all of it is the lie that if God really loved me, he would let me do what I wanted. If God really loved me, I wouldn't be going through this suffering. If God really loved me, he wouldn't hide himself from me. If God really loved me, he would come here right now and do what I want him to do. If God really loved me, he wouldn't allow me to fall into sin or temptation. If God really loved me, he would heal this disease. If God really loved me, he would provide me with more money. If God really loved me, then people would have, uh, wouldn't have any problems with me. Whatever it is, Satan's got one trick left. And it's to question the love that God has for you. But listen, my friends. Truth always overcomes deception. So hear the living word of God. This is God himself speaking to your hearts today. And God is saying, 
Let the veil drop from your eyes. Let the scales come off. Listen to what God himself is saying. There is nothing that could ever separate you from the love of God. There is nothing. There is no condemnation. There is no charge. There is no sin. There is no failure. There is no power in all of creation. Nothing, nothing, nothing can ever stop God from loving you. Listen, he's loved you infinitely in the past. He loves you that way today. He will love you that way forever and ever. He's demonstrated that love objectively in sending his most precious relationship his son to come here and to die for you and I he will and is giving us all things God loves you listen all day long Satan is going to try to fight against it if God really loved you he would do this if God really loved you he wouldn't do that listen to the word of the Lord God loves you there is nothing you can do to make him love you more there is nothing you can do to make him love you less There is nothing in all of existence that can ever come between his love for you. And whatever you are experiencing right now, good or bad, whatever you are going through, it is somehow an expression of God's love for you. That's why earlier God told us, I work all things together for good to those who are called according to my purpose. Even when others mean it for evil, like Joseph, when his brothers sold him into captivity, God was working for his good because God loves Joseph. The same is true for you and I. And if there's one gift I prayed all week that the Spirit would give you, is that you might know the depth of God's love for you. It doesn't matter what sins you've done. There's no charge that can ever stand against you. Listen. Listen. Jesus Christ is interceding for you. Do you know what this means? That in the courtroom of heaven, can you imagine anyone, you or me or any human or any demon or any Satan coming into the courtroom and saying, you need to not love that person because of look what they've done. At the same time, Jesus is standing there saying, I paid for all of those sins. Who do you think God the Father is going to listen to? How could he possibly be a just judge? And look at what Jesus gave so that you and I could have life and let any charge against us stand. How could he ever possibly condemn us without denying his son, without denying himself? There is nothing that he could do. How could he not give us all things? All things belong to Jesus and we belong to Jesus. God gives all things to us. How can he not fight for us? Jesus, our Lord, is standing there praying for us. Who could possibly be against us? And the great deception of Satan. Look at all these things against you. Look at all the sins that you've done. Nobody could possibly love you. Look at all the difficulty in your life. No one could possibly love you and let you go through these things. It's so easy to be deceived. The only solution for deception is what God himself says. There is nothing, nothing, nothing that could ever stop God from loving us infinitely, totally, completely for eternity. What should we say in response to these things? We moved the sermon up a little bit earlier in the service so that we might have a chance to respond in praise and worship and thanks to God. Now some of you like at the end of the service to run for the door. I understand some of that. But today, what's the proper response to the news that God loves you totally and completely? It's to stay and sing and thank him and praise his name. We are not consumed because of God's unfailing love. His goodness, his mercies are new every morning. God is constantly dreaming up new ways to bless us. There is no good thing he has or ever will withhold from us. Every spiritual blessing is ours. And so we stop to sing and to say thank you to a God who loves us totally and completely.